And now we move on to part two of the tracking and parameter estimation lecture of the Introduction and in Radar Systems course, and this is lecture nine, part two. When we finished part one, uh, the last subject we discussed was amplitude comparison uh, fa uh, monopulse techniques. Now we're going to move on to talk briefly about phase comparison monopulse techniques for measuring angle, which are used far less frequently. Uh, here we have a diagram, a cartoon on the left, which shows an example of how one would make that measurement. We have the radar echo coming in, a wavefront, from an angle uh, theta, off of the bore side of the antennas. And in phase comparison monopulse, we use two antennas, two antennas. And see here's antenna one and antenna two, each having a, be the, a beam hitting it with the same wave front. And the, the difference in path length between where the antenna hits, the, f the beam hits the first antenna and the second antenna, that path length difference is d sine theta, where theta is the angle from the bore side of the antenna to the to the target, between the line of sight to the target and the bore side of the antenna. Now, the, the received target echo varies in phase according to d sine theta divided by 2 pi with a factor of lambda to count the number of wavelengths. So that's the phase difference. So if you measure the phase difference between the signal that arrives arrives from at antenna 1 and antenna 2, that's directly, and you know the distance between the two antennas and the wavelength, you can deduce exactly what the angle that the radiation came in at. And that is how phase comparison monopulse techniques work. Um, unlike amplitude comparison monopulse that receives beams in different directions, this receives the radiation from one direction but at two antennas. Okay. Now, scanning antennas, radars that scan mechanically make fine angle estimation a, a different way. What they do is, uh, is shown in, the, in this next uh, collage of, of uh, graphs. And here we have First of all, the antenna pattern, and we see we, we've got a main beam, and this red mark is where the fixed target is located, and if we have an antenna that's like this airport surveillance radar, it mechanically scans an azimuth going around. This particular one goes around once every 4.7 seconds, about 12 RPM, and the antenna, be antenna beam scans an azimuth by the target. And, and as it's emitting pulses. This particular um, radar will uh, transmit about 20 to 25 pulses on the target. And the, um, the amplitude of both the, the signal that hits the target and the echo back are uh, modulated by the antenna beam pattern. So that, as the, so that uh, this uh, collage of antenna patterns show you the position of the antenna relative to the target for each of the different pulses. Now you can see that when the antenna beam is pointed uh, over in this direction, it'll it'll as as the antenna comes from left to right, there'll be detections. Here, 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 and here. And in this case, we have the declared target at the center. But what one would do usually is take the antenna pattern and compare that with the pattern of the detections and, um, and see how, uh, do a fit to the antenna pattern to the set of detections, or take a weighted average of the amplitudes um, and to uh, weight the amplitudes for, and average together the uh, different returns that are 
uh, declared targets and therefore you'll get an accurate estimate of where the target is within the beam. Usually this method can work go about one, one part in eight, one part in ten with reason, quite reasonable signal to noise ratios. Okay, So for tra these radars which measure um, angle and track while the antenna is mechanically rotating by are called track wall scan radars and it's measured by either taking the highest target return or I said as I said before measuring with interpolation and angle me the angle measurements using the known antenna pattern or some similar technique. Okay, when you have array antennas angle estimation techniques that can be used are both phase and amplitude and phased array antennas are well suited for this monopulse tracking. Here we have a phased array antenna that's from the BEMUSE radar, ballistic missile early warning radar system, and also a uh, multiple object tracking radar, which is a phased array antenna that uses a lens design. It doesn't have separate TR modules all along the face. It has just the phase shifters, and the phase shifters are set up with the appropriate phase that uh, a horn back here will uh, receive the beam and transmit the beam. Okay. Now, uh, with the amplitude comparison monopulse techniques, the radiative elements can, can be combined three different ways. You can com put all of them together to make the sum pattern. You can combine the right hand side of the beam, the right hand side of the face with the left hand side of the face to do azimuth difference monopulse and the top and the bottom half to do elevation difference monopulse patterns. Uh, phase comparison monopulse can use the top and bottom half for elevation and the top right and left half for azimuth. Uh, up here the, co the, uh, the, the different pieces, uh, the different receive elements would send the components into different receivers and that's how the monopulse uh, technique would be implemented. So it would be inside the, the antenna itself that it could be implemented. Now how accurately can you make estimates with monopulse angle techniques? Uh, remember we said that the accuracy was the beam width divided by the square root of the signal to noise ratio and for a typical signal to noise ratio that we've been talking about in the past for good detection of 13 dB uh, that'll allow us to um, get 10 to 1 beam splitting. So with 13 dB beam width, a 13 dB of signal to noise ratio if the detection threshold is 13 dB, uh, beam width can be split by 10 to 1. Okay. Now I'd just like to go over a couple of um, definitions that you may hear and I'd like you to understand them exactly. Sort of what's the difference between accuracy, precision, and resolution. Um, now accuracy is the degree of conformity of measurements to their true value. Okay. Now here we have a bullseye and the black marks mark where either an arrow or a bullet has hit. Obviously the degree of conformity to the measurement to the true place you want to hit would be if you got, uh, you'd be very highly accurate if you hit the center. Okay. Precision refers to the repeatability of the measurements. In other words, um, it, it's a, it says we have a small uh, bias error. Uh, excuse me. The bias error I'd like to define first. The bias error is the true value minus the average of the measured value. If the average of the measured values are all clustered together, then we have high precision. It's only when they are both clustered. To, this would be an example over here on the right of some bullets that had very high precision but low accuracy. There's a significant bias error. And here in the center we have both high accuracy, we're hitting very close to where we want to and high precision, and here in the left we have low accuracy, we're far away from the bullseye, and low precision, they're not, repeat, not very repeatable. Okay. 
Now, resolution is our ability to separate two targets. When we see the amplitudes, say if our ability to resolve two targets in angle, we would look at the return that we get as a function of angle. And if we had, uh, here we have two targets at 0 and 6 degrees, and if we have about a 2.5, uh, 3 degree beam, we'll be able to see that indeed we have two targets. This would say we're able to resolve two targets at uh, targets at 0 and 6 degrees. We see two specific bumps. Now here we have a target at, at 0 degrees and 3 degrees and we can't resolve them. They're, they're, the, uh, they're too far apart. They, we see them as just one bump so they're unresolved. Here's a, a, a case of an unresolved target and a resolved, where we've resolved two targets. Okay? In each case there are multiple targets, but with the better resolution, or rather than better resolution, with the targets being further apart, we're able to resolve them. Now on to Doppler velocity estimation. The Doppler frequency is given by twice the vo radial velocity over the wavelength, and what we do is we use two closely spaced Doppler filters uh, that are offset from the center frequency of the Doppler filter containing the detection. So here's the target velocity. We have two Doppler filters that overlap so they both detect the target. Uh, knowing the shape of the uh, Doppler frequency response and knowing the amplitude of the detection in each of the two filters, we can estimate the, um, the exact Doppler frequency. And the Doppler frequency measurement accuracy is proportional, as we said earlier, to the wavelength divided by the coherent integration time, and it's proportional to the inverse of the square root of the signal-to-noise ratio. Now, what are the real-world limitations to accuracy? Well, receiver noise can be a big factor. It's going to add uh, a width of variance to the estimates we make. If a radar isn't calibrated well, it'll lead to poor estimations, and the calibration uh, quite often will lead to a bias where we, th we will very precisely say the target is located at this range, this range, this range, but it's really a separate range because we're not calibrated uh, quite exactly. And we could be calibrated either on the scale, the magnification, or we could be offset. The offset would be a bias. Amplitude fluctuations in the target can affect both monopulse and array accuracy solutions. And then also, uh, angle glint and, scint and scintillations of the target and angle scintillations from complex targets. Uh, that is to say, if we had an, a complex target and we got returns from multiple scatterers on the object, that can cause the angle measurement, which depends on phase, to uh, oscillate wildly. Uh, in, in, mon in the monopulse equation, you notice it depended on the cosine of the phase of the difference between the sum and difference signal. If you have multiple scatterers within the cell that you're measuring, uh, that angle noise can be very great and can actually cause the uh, target to appear outside the cell of interest. And a monopulse can break down uh, when you have multiple targets within the range azimuth cell of interest. And also multipath, which we talked about in the propagation uh, lecture, uh, can give angle problems when we're doing low angle tracking. Uh, this next diagram shows you a little better, brings you back to a cartoon we showed you earlier, where we have reflections off the Earth's surface combined with the direct path, and this um, interference can cause biases in the angle estimates for all the different techniques. Now, on our outline, we're moving on to tracking. Okay, this, uh, this, these two, the first photograph on the left shows you a whole bunch of detections that come over many, many scans of the radar, and this would be a track well scan radar, most probably, I'm guessing. And these would be the observations you get. And just from your human eye, looking on the, the left, your eye can correlate and say, well, these are probably all correlated with the same physical object. These probably are, these are, these here are, those are, and those are. 
Now, our eye can't tell just from what you see whether this detection came and then that one came and then that one and that one. A very improbable event, obviously. We can't tell right now the time correlation, but inside a computer you can, and with taking it into account that probably the track started at one end or the other here, you've got a detection here, then another one a little more up and more up, and gee, we know the direction the target's heading, we'll know where to look and find new detections to add to that track file you'd form a track. And over here, this is a typical tracker output. And what you'll have are tracks from actual targets that are existing tracks, and then you'll have a lot of little new tracks. And these new tracks, some of them may be caused by noise, and some of them may be ca caused by targets which have just moved into the volume scan of the, an of the antenna, and they're just starting off. So uh, the tracker receives new observations every scan, uh, some of them are observations from the target, and some of them are false alarms. And as you can probably guess, these little dots in and around here are false alarms. And then new tracks are initiated. That'll be the sequence. We always try to find the new tracks. Existing tracks will be updated. And tracks which we don't get any more detections from, after a while, they'll be deleted from the track file. Now we're going to go over in just a little bit the exact logical process that a tracker follows. Okay? And this, and, when, and this is all done by a computer in the um, data processing computer section of the block diagram. It's in, uh, we're going to go over what the algorithms are for automatic detection and tracking. Now, after we've used our clutter rejection techniques, um, uh, now we're able to automate detection and tracking. Uh, years ago, before good clutter rejection techniques uh, happened, automatic tracking techniques really weren't used at all, and, and then when they were tried, they didn't work well. But now that we're able to have you, you use and implement first-rate uh, clutter rejection uh, signal processing techniques, pretty much what we see in the residue of the targets we want to see, and noise, which is pretty much random. That's what we see most of the time. And the detection and tracking functions are target detection and target association. We're going to take at them just one at a time. Target detection, of course, we uh, perform that function by having an adaptive threshold. We went over that earlier in the detection lecture, and we'll apply that to each range azimuth Doppler cell. Then after that, we want to associate uh, uh, threshold crossings from adjacent range azimuth do Doppler cells or nearly adjacent ones. We want to associate them and say, hey, they probably come one from another and use that to calculate the uh, range and azimuth and Doppler of the target. So first we'll look and say, hey, are there any neighbors nearby, neighbors that would be caused by detections in the main lobe in azimuth, elevation, and Doppler? and cluster them all together and say, yeah, these guys are all part of one target. And after we say that, yeah, all part of one target, we want to make the best estimate possible of that range azimuth and Doppler of the target on a single scan basis. Okay. Now, what do we do with that detection afterwards? We send it through this logic right here. Okay. The first thing we do is because we've got a lot of investment in them is if we have tracks that we Audit, we, we really kn we know from real targets, we know that it's most probable that uh, new data is, could be associated with a real track that's continuing than if it just pops up and it's just a, you know, a detection, do we want to start a new track? So the first thing you try to do is correlate any new detections with existing tracks. See if they correlate and add to a new track. We don't want to set up a new track every scan. We first want to do the correlation. And then we want to, asso this association is added by seeing if the detections fall within a search window. We'll look at that in a minute. Then with the detections that didn't associate, what we'll do is we'll initiate new tracks for a little bit and, see, and, and set a window out and see if other detections in the next scan are nearby to see if we can start up tracks. And target initiation in dense clutter environments can stress a clutter, a computer resources we have available. 
And so what we do is we measure, develop the uh, detection reports uh, with new observations and then try to associate them with um, existing targets first and the ones that don't associate we go into the initiation but then also after we update targets we go into the prediction and say hey where should the target be next so we can do association at a later time okay now we're, d we're in the track association and update we have uh, the present location of the target and at that point we know its range, azimuth, elevation, and its velocity vector. And from that, we're able to predict where the target should be. And if it's not maneuvering, if, it's, if, it's, if there aren't any accelerations on the object between where we see it, or any differences in acceleration, we're, we're pretty well able to say that the target, where it should be, and what the errors are based on our ability to measure range angle and Doppler. And so we can put um, a boundary in range azimuth uh, space and Doppler space as to where in that volume we should expect it the, in the next scan the target to appear if it's, and it have one volume if it's non-maneuvering but if it maneuvered it could go off and take a, a jog if an airplane say was uh, going in a straight line and then it took a maneuver and took a right hand turn so to speak but, might be in five seconds, it's going at right angles and would be outside this non-maneuvering so-called range gate. So we set up a couple of range gates and as I said the size of that gate is determined by the estimation errors of the predicted position and the speed, errors in the speed and direction of the target and we want that gate small enough that we'll hopefully have not more than one detection falling within the gate. We would just, we'd like to have just one fall within the gate. We don't want it so big, a lot of noise false alarms would fall in there too, but we want it large enough to uh, detect turns and targets. And sometimes, as I said, that's handled by having two gates, a non-maneuvering gate and a maneuvering gate. And if association is successful, we update the track files, say where the target is moved to, and if not, we um, do a new, have a new target and initiate a new target, this box over here. Okay, now after we've associated the target, then we want to use a tracker, a filtering technique, which would do the prediction of where it would go. And there are different methods of developing this prediction technique. One's an alpha beta tracker, another one's called the Kalman filter. And these estimate, take the present estimates of where we have measured the target to be and its velocity, predict where it will be in the future, and so that process continues. Now, if we didn't find data for a couple of scans of the radar, uh, in the meantime, when we don't find it for a scan or two, we might coast the target and say, well, there might have been a dropout, because there's a just a finite probability that we'll see a target there, and there's a finite probability that we won't. In the meantime, what we do is we we'll coast the target, the track, if we don't see it. And if after a number of scans that we uh, fail to see it, the target may have landed if it's an aircraft, um, it may, if it's a missile, it might have been shot down or whatever, and a, a note would go to the display operator that the target was then terminated. Okay? Now, the, the techniques that I just described are those typically used with uh, an airport surveillance radar or a scanning radar. When you're tracking with a phased array radar, you use very similar techniques, but there's some advantages you have with a phased array radar. When we talked about uh, phased array antennas, you noted that we have beam agility. We can electronically move the beams anywhere we want and move them very fast. So we can have a very high update rate, uh, much higher than with a mechanical scanning antenna, where it might take you, oh, five or six seconds to move a heavy antenna over 20 or 30 degrees with an, uh, an electronically scanned array. You can move in microseconds, in tens of microseconds, you can move the beam over and collect data. So uh, we can collect uh, data uh, and track data on targets at multiple places in wide solid angle with phased array radars. And that's an advantage that they have. And we, uh, there's no closed loop uh, feedback controlling the radar beam 
with phased arrays, the computer controls the radar beam and the track update rate. And that is done with algorithms within the control computer, which says how often we go back. Uh, they're not the feedback loops and tracking that we would use with uh, those dish radars when we talked about monopulse and, and conical scanning. So there aren't those control, control loops, uh, so to speak. Okay. Now there's one other tr uh, detector detection method I want to um, mention, and it's called a lot of different things. It's called track before detect, um, long-term coherent integration, um, and what it basically is doing, it's gobbling into the computer. Not, you're not looking at the data one scan at a time and then saying, okay, some, some targets I'll initiate a track on, some I'll add to tracks they already have. What you do is you put a lot of data in the computer all together, say from 10 or 15, 20 scans of the radar, and then you, you try a whole bunch of hypotheses uh, for all of the detections fitting together such that they make sense from a kinematic point of view and from a time causality point of view. That is that they lie along a relatively smooth line in space and time at a reasonable velocity. We don't, you don't allow uh, incredible non-physical changes in acceleration of velocity. And these uh, long integration times imply the target may transverse, traverse many resolution selves during this integration time. And since the target trajectory is not known ahead of time, you assume all possible trajectories. When you think about that, you say, gee, that computer is really going to be crunching. And it is true. This technique is very intensive computationally, but computers have grown incredibly powerful in the past years. And a correct trajectory is one that gives us, as I said, a realistic speed and, and direction for the type of target being observed. And in a sense, what you're doing is you're tracking the target before it is declared a detection. Sometimes this is called retrospective detection, a long-term integration, but this same process which I've just described is what's happening. And this allows you, when you do that, it allows you to raise the probability of false alarm per scan that you can tolerate, maybe 10 to the minus 3 probability of false alarm per cell, rather than 10 to the minus 5 or 6, and you let the computer do the chugging before you declare a target. Okay. And that you see, so you've got a lot of constraints, maybe 20 scans in a row, it's got to make good sense that you've got a target that's kinematically reasonable with realistic speeds and directions before you display it to an operator. Okay? And that also has the, that, that extra demanding that it makes sense for a large number of scans from a physical point of view um, allows you to, to, to process all those extra false alarms without displaying them because you're not going to display anything until you've seen it for a long time. Now what that does is that there's a significant delay between where you first might see the target and you declare it. That's a downside of this, but it allows you to see lower signal-to-noise ratio targets with reasonable probabilities of detecting the track. And as I said, this requires very strong data processing capability and long observation times. So now in summary, summarizing what we've learned about parameter estimation and tracking, Parameter estimation techniques enable the radar to get very good, accurate radar measurements in range, angle, and Doppler. And monopulse angle estimation allows sub-beam width accuracy to see within a beam width when we're talking for single pulse radars just where the target is. And we went over techniques also for measuring a, a range accurately and Doppler accurately. And there are limitations to these monopulse techniques due to multiple targets or interference. And we went over tracking algorithms and how they work and how they help us to uh, find and predict the target track and get the best fit between our measured data and the actual location of the target's trajectory.